Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for coming to this hopefully engaging and enriching Think JSAO event. I'm delighted that we have Dr. Nicholas Reynolds with us. He's the author of the recently published book, In Time for the 75th Anniversary of the Birth of the CIA, Need to Know, World War II, and the Rise of American Intelligence. And I thought this was appropriate for JSAO because a lot of the book covers what we're calling the first age of SOF. And there's many lessons that we can learn from studying this first age of SOF. In particular, we all know the OSS here. And when you think about the OSS, think about some of the figures. Uh, its founder, William J. Wild Bill Donovan, William Colby, the founder of American Special Forces, Colonel Aaron Bank, Virginia Hall, the limping lady who walked over the Pyrenees with a prosthetic leg and then went back to France to serve in the OSS. And when you consider their backgrounds, the OSS had lawyers, they had academics with PhDs, they had military officers, they had Marines. And the reason I mention those careers is Nick is literally all of those things. So just by way of background, Nick has a BA from Swarthmore College. Uh, I'm an alum of Swarthmore. That's one of the ways Nick and I cl uh, connected. He has a JD from University of Virginia. Because he's a glutton for academic punishment, a PhD from Oxford. Then Nick commissioned as an infantry officer in the Marine Corps. And eventually as a reservist, he was the colonel and officer in charge of field history for the Marine Corps. Now, while not on call with the Corps, Nick was also an operations officer for the CIA and later the historian of the CIA Museum. He wasn't done yet because he's taught at Johns Hopkins in the Naval War College. And then to top it all off, he's the best-selling author of the book, Writer, Sailor, Soldier, Spy, Ernest Hemingway's Secret Adventures, 1935 to 1961. So uh, with that, please join me in welcoming Nick Reynolds. I wanted to begin with that background, actually, OSS background and your personal background. You know, the OSS brought in this larger than life cast of characters and they had academics, they had practitioners and they put them in one organization. Uh, how did that work? You know, how did they cooperate? What were the areas of conflict? How did they join to serve the cause of the nation? So great question. Thank you, uh, Jeff, for the wonderful welcome. And it's great to be here. Uh, I've been to MacDill a couple times in my career, uh, but never to JSAO because there was no JSAO. So uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really in favor of uh, education in the intel field, and uh, I, I'm so happy to see that there's an institution like JSAO. Uh, so the question was, uh, how did the various people who were brought into OSS, uh, how did they mesh? Uh, how did their skills complement each other or not? Uh, I'm afraid the wartime answer is not so much, uh, and that's because the, they, when they started at OSS, they didn't know what they didn't know, uh, and uh, people tended to get into their own uh, operational cones, cylinders of excellence, silo, uh, and uh, they got insanely busy, sort of like working in a three shop in an infantry battalion, and uh, you know you just don't have time to sit and think about what you're doing. So uh, you had all this talent. OSS contribution was bringing this talent in the door and getting a whole new segment of Americans interested in intelligence. But during the war, did you see, did you see an intel? So uh, OSS had uh, research and analysis. So that's the Directorate of, of Intelligence, or uh, these days analysis at CIA. Uh, brilliant guys. I mean, the best, the best of the best in, in American uh, academic circles. Uh, they produce good products. They never could figure out how to how to reach the the their audience. They never could figure out uh, how to how to disseminate it to the people who mattered and interest the people who mattered in their products. So uh, and they were also facing a lot of competition from the SIGINT guys who who kind of had a head start and and um, uh, were able to interest the their audiences. So um, it's it's great that we're there. But they, you know, it's, it wasn't a mature organization. Uh, did some great things, but um, working together actually wasn't one of them. Well, and that goes to your personal background because you bring both the, you, you know, as you say, you're a card-carrying academic, a card-carrying intelligence officer. So how did that help you write the book and a analyze those issues and actually see them and how they were operationalized at the time? So one, I, I, that's a 
great segue from the last question. Um, so what, 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 what do CIA operations officers do, right? Do they go to school? Do they, uh, do they think big thoughts about uh, intelligence and, and targeting and whatnot? Not in my day. Uh, you just got busy and you, you started doing it and uh, there's no, in, in, in my day there was no CIA university. There is a CIA university now. Uh, but the, but if, if you said, uh, I'd like to go away and, and think about the Russian target for six months and come up with a proposal, uh, they would have said, you're crazy. Uh, you're going to go, you know, they, you, you're going to go to a station somewhere and you're going to start uh, working down our, our pre-existing target list. I think it's a little more thoughtful now, but, um, you know, there's, a, there's, there's this ops tempo. And, and CIA is a small outfit compared to the military. So military can afford to take... Uh, you know, every fifth officer offline for a year and send him to war college. Uh, that has not been the case at CIA up to now, as far as I know. So I, I retired in 2009, uh, and I'm not the spokesman for the CIA. But there is, there is, there's always, uh, to my knowledge, there's always been this this drive to um, to operate, and that that doesn't always mesh with um, with thinking about what you're doing, uh, and so that. To answer your question uh, in another way, uh, that kind of contributed to this book, in the sense that um, you know I, I isolated centers of excellence who actually did manage to think about what they were doing and and um, <clears throat> be thoughtful as um, as intelligence officers. And that brings to the point of there's a lot of myth and fol folklore about the OSS, and certainly what you do is you demythologize the OSS in a lot of ways. Maybe you can talk about some of the myths and in particular how it relates to this analysis versus operations because when we think of OSS we tend to think of Jedbergs, parachuting over France, the France and the resistance versus you know the eggheads sitting in RNA who are doing the targeting and you know looking at the, the bigger picture questions. So um, you know OSS, uh, so o o OSS operationally um, you know, so <clears throat> it's, it's, it's hard to get done. I guess, what did I demythologize? Uh, Donovan himself is, a, is an uh, immensely interesting uh, character, and he left a, uh, a mixed legacy. Uh, so he's a World War I hero. He's got the Medal of Honor uh, and a number of other decorations from World War I. Uh, but he's also a... a um, what's the right word? He's an inter internationalist, but he... He, he is, um, he's something of a, <clears throat> I don't want to overstate the case, but he's a, he, he's, he's a, um, he's very much into the ops tempo, right? He's very, <clears throat> what I was talking about before, he's very much into making things happen. And uh, that's a good thing insofar as uh, America hadn't really thought about having an intelligence agency before Donovan came. Once, done, once these organiz once so COI was the first uh, out of the gate, and that morphed into OSS. Uh, you know, once these started to become uh, larger organizations, Donovan wasn't really the right guy to run a large organization, uh, and and uh, I I try to demonstrate that in the book, in in a number of ways. He kept he he kept wanting to land with the first wave of uh, allied. Uh, troops in the war in Europe, and so um, you know, at, at General, um, that's not your job. You know, you're not a rifleman. Uh, there's nothing for you to do on the battlefield uh, except get possibly get captured, uh, which would be an enormous embarrassment if the Germans figured out who you were. And so this is this is this is the push pull in in OSS as an organization. Um, so you, it, it needed. It eventually needed to mature, and uh, I would argue it needed somebody other than Donovan to help it mature. That's a marvelous vignette, too, in the book. Could you just tell everyone about, because Donovan didn't land on D-Day, he landed on D-plus-1. Right. <laughs> tell us a little bit more so, about that so trip. So Donovan, Donovan had sort of set out. He was, like a, um, was, he, was, he was like a Boy Scout wanting badges, right? Uh, and so he had made a couple of the other, he made Sicily, he made... Uh, another landing in Italy, uh, and then he wanted to be in on D-Day, uh, and the so Schaaf was aware that he wanted to do this. He made no secret of it. Uh, the Washington was aware. The Secretary of the Navy uh, issued an order 
to, uh, it was like an uh, all nav or, or uh, uh, whatever the, the ad address was for uh, ships in Europe, saying, don't take this man on board, right? So this is Forrestal, who was uh, kind of a forceful guy. He'd been a boxer and he had a, had a, had a, uh, a squashed nose from being a boxer. So he said, he's gonna keep Donovan from going ashore. And um, Donovan took the chief of London, who was uh, basically the senior OSS guy on the ground in Europe, and said, we're going to figure out how to get uh, on, on land uh, either with, uh, on the first day or, the, or shortly thereafter. And so when you think about it, this is the, these are the two. So the, one is the, the international director of OSS. The other is the, the theater chief. And Donovan, and they go offline because they're basically skirting their own command. Uh, and, and they disappear for like five days. They're out of touch with their office. And it's all so that Donovan can get his feet wet. Sort of, sort of a, you know, I have returned moment like uh, another army general who actually, they were in the same formation in World War I, Douglas MacArthur and Donovan getting um, either the distinguished, I think distinguished service cross at that. And you, you take, a, it was like four officers there. And you take a look and on the, on the left is, is uh, MacArthur and on the right is Donovan and Pershing is giving the awards. It's a great photograph. So basically um, disobedient, um, I think reckless and uh, you know, reckless because they could have been captured uh, and, and a, a waste of his, his uh, local representative's time. You, I mean, what, you, you're, not supposed to be, um, you're not supposed to be out there out of touch at the, the biggest operation, which, which by the way, I portray as an intelligence success. So Pearl Harbor, there's, there's sort of an arc between Pearl Harbor, the intelligence failure, and uh, the um, and, and D-Day, uh, which is in large part an intelligence success. And uh, <coughs> read the book because it's 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 a story that almost it has you laughing, it has you concerned. They got strafed they got by strafed, Messerschmitts, yeah. and you know poor David K. E. Bruce is, oh. did not think he was going to be landing on a beach with Donovan walking into the field and meeting Omar Bradley. Well, um, and this is, I mean, this is though Donovan, there was, there was another one uh, story that you related where he took a plane ride in deep into oh, China, yeah. Burma, India theater with Carl Eifler, who was in charge of Debt 101. So, that was OSS in Burma. So maybe talk, us, talk to us about that, so <laughs> that story. Debt that, that 101 is the first sort of out of the gate uh, OSS uh, field unit and uh and and it's carl eifler in the china burma india theater carl eifler is an army reservist a big guy uh six something 200 something pounds uh, and he had known uh general stillwell before the war and they'd gotten along and uh donovan grabs stillwell when he's in washington and says hey i got just the thing for you you don't know you need it but you you'll like it once you get it and stillwell says something like yeah yeah sure uh, and then uh, Eifler shows up in, in, in theater and uh, Stillwell recognizes him and says, what are you doing here? And uh, Eifler says, well, General, you remember you said you would take us in. And still, you know, it's Stillwell had the, one of the toughest jobs in the war and Stillwell goes, oh, okay, I'm not gonna send you back. And he says, well, you can't do too much damage in Burma. So why don't you run ops from Northern India or, or um, so Northern Burma, there was a sort of a not exactly demilitarized zone, but uh, lightly occupied, and, and in southern India they had a base. And so they ran uh, special ops in there. And uh, Donovan comes out, and uh, he wants to go to one of these uh, remote bases that's like 100 miles um, south of the border. And Eifler, who, well, what, who was a current pilot at some point in his life, but not at this point, uh, says he's going to fly him in in like a gypsy moth, uh, sort of the equivalent of a, a Piper Cub, uh, you know, a small two-seater. And both these guys are kind of heavy, and it was a, a really risky proposition. Uh, but they had to do it because they thought it was the they thought it was the warrior thing to do. Uh, and they had a nice day, and they came out of it. But it was a really a, a, a near-run thing. Uh, the plane almost crashed. The Japanese were unaware. Um, but it's not, it's not just me saying this, it's not just sort of the academic uh, former CIA guy who's saying, hey, what a crazy risk. Uh, it's people at the time who were there who are saying, General, this is an unacceptable risk uh, in, that, in that instance and then uh, later on, um, as we said, at D-Day. At and let's talk about the unacceptable risk because Donovan 
despite the resistance of the British and American units, signals intelligence units, held secrets to Ultra and Magic. And he knew that that was valuable in both theaters uh, if he was captured by the Germans or the Japanese. Um, why, was, why was signals intelligence so valuable? Because you cover a lot of signals intelligence you need to know. So I'm, uh, you know, if you read this book and, and without looking at my uh, resume, you'd go, oh, hey, this guy worked at NSA uh, because there's so much there's, there's so much about signals intelligence and, and, uh, and, and they uh, kind of uh, emerge as the heroes here. Uh, I say um, signals intelligence is, is the major uh, American uh, intelligence coup of World War II. And it starts before the war. Uh, it's primarily an army story. Um, it's not exclusively an army story. There is a, 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 a Navy uh, counterpart. But the, the Army has the longest, they, they, they have the longest amount of time on target, uh, starting in World War I, uh, when, the, when the Navy was actually buying code books, uh, you know, in dime stores, and, and you know, just didn't see the, the importance of this. So the Army starts in World War I, and um, by uh, 1940, they've already, you know, they've got a little body, a, a tiny body, but just an amazingly skilled uh, body of code breakers. And with a yellow pad and a pencil, they break the Japanese diplomatic code. I, it's just, it's just an amazing story. I mean, I can barely do, uh, I can't do Sudoku. I can do a crossword puzzle. And it's like doing Sudoku all day, right? All day, that, at every day. And you look at these patterns. You look at, at sheets of, of numbers. And you eventually uh, spot, oh, this might, this might mean that. Uh, and, and that's how they break the, the Japanese code. And then they reverse engineer, okay? The, the guy named Frank Rowlett, who was one of William F. Friedman, the, their, their leaders, uh, deputies, in his spare time, in his garage with a couple other guys, at night, they're going, well, I'll bet we can reverse engineer this thing. So they've got, they've got broken Japanese messages, <clears throat> they've got unbroken Japanese messages, and they create this thing. It looks like the uh, Back to the Future, the, the professor and the car and whatnot. Uh, they create a machine that you feed the, the um, encrypted message in, and a, an unencrypted message comes out. Amazing, amazing. And just to, just to give you an idea of, of um, where they are as an organization, sometime in the middle of war, somebody goes, well, what, what level is Frank Rowlett cleared to? So like the number two, number three guy in Army co-breaking. And everybody's looking around the room. Well, what what clearance does he have? And they, by this time, we've already had you know the starting to get the system that we have now. And they found out he had no clearances because he had started to do this before there were clearances. So um, this the code breaking grows enormously during World War II, and uh, it, it like I say, it's the it's the big success story. Uh, the arm uh, the army has this. It, it's, it, to me, that is the strategic intelligence, that the best strategic intelligence we had. Navy has pretty good, it's like tactical operational level, um, but the, the, the stars are the Army for, for a number of reasons that I can, I can get into further if you want. Well, and it was another Wall Street attorney, like Donovan was yeah. a Wall Street attorney, uh, Alfred McCormack, because it wasn't just a matter of breaking the codes, it was doing the analysis, creating an intelligence product, distributing it to policymakers. So maybe talk through how Alfred McCormack then filled in that missing link to just the raw intelligence. Yeah. So what, what happens before, so they, they break the code, they build this machine, and, and so what the decision maker in Washington gets, and it's, it's the president and maybe uh, Secretary of State, Secretary of War, uh, maybe the Secretary of the Navy if, if they were feeling good, uh, and so in, in 1940-41, you'd be handed a raw decrypt in the morning with your coffee, right? And you could look at it. It's translated into English. You, it's, it was a little bit curated in the sense that they didn't show everything. They kind of tried to pick what was important. But there was no analysis. You got to look at it for like five minutes, and they took it away and burned it. Uh, so uh, Stimson, uh, so that's the uh, Henry L. Stimson, uh, amazing resume, uh, uh, Secretary of War twice, uh, Secretary of State, Governor General of the Philippines, uh, leading Wall Street lawyer himself, um, owned two large estates, one of which was 17 acres in, in Washington, and you guys know the city, Rock Creek Park area. Um, 
and, uh, and, and he goes, can we do any better than this? And when, when he comes back to Washington in the war, by the way, he's 72 years old, 72 years old. And, and he's coming as a Republican internationalist. He hates the New Deal, but he and Roosevelt are pretty much on the same uh, wavelength when it comes to foreign policy. And, uh, and, and he says, you know, was there anything we missed before the war? And, uh, and how, can we, how can we optimize this going forward? And he's talking to John McCloy, uh, who's a uh, famous guy post-war, especially in the occupation of Germany. And uh, McCloy is another Wall Street lawyer. McCloy says, uh, the only people who can answer that question are uh, our fellow Wall Street lawyers. And they call this guy Alfred McCormick to Washington. He's a history buff. He's a partner in Cravath Swain, who's one of the biggest uh, Wall Street law firms still there. Uh, and, and he's made a lot of money uh, already. And he comes to work basically for free uh, and, and uh, works from, uh, he gets there like, he's, he's there by 07. Uh, he goes home when the work's done. Uh, he requires uh, people who work for him to work every, 13 out of 14 days. 14th day they get off. Uh, and uh, he creates a system. So it's not just the raw decrypt anymore, but you have some context. Like this is the fifth time they've mentioned this subject and we see a trend from this position to that position. Uh, it's not quite what we would see today, but it's it's getting there, and uh, so that's that that to me is is kind of the um, you know that's that's the big success story, and it shows it shows the professionalization of intelligence. As a, you know, there there is no intelligence profession before uh, you get the code breakers. They're great code breakers. They're mathematicians. They're 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 um, uh, you know scientists. They're engineers. They're tinkerers. But they're not really intelligence officers. And so uh, this is where you see. Um, sort of modern intelligence, you know, being conceived and 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 starting to enter the the. So poor McCormick. So McCormick, after these guys, we, we tend to forget a lot of these guys just get worn out by the war. And you can imagine uh, McCormick with that that uh, work schedule. Uh, he's in his 40s uh, during the war. Um, these guys, uh, they almost all smoke cigarettes all day. All, I mean, just even even guys who who knew enough. Uh, to put the to, to lose the cigarette when the photographer was there, uh, almost all the seniors in World War II are just huge smokers, uh, and and they're also uh, you know their relaxation is is a drink or two. And by the end of the war, a lot of them are just wiped out. And so you see, like like um, you know a, a, a reasonable percentage of these guys they die within five or ten years of the end of the war, even though they're not even um, retirement age and they. Uh, so that's that's my personal theory is p in part fact-free analysis because I haven't done you know I haven't gotten 50 60 names to see how it went but but you, you I'm just struck by and, and he's one of them he he, he passes in the in the mid 50s and in the mid 1950s which are also the mid 50s for him and and he's somebody uh, uh, editorial writer in the in the Washington Post gives him like uh, three inches when he dies. So it's an unsigned editorial and it says, uh, you know, uh, Alfred McCormick died this week. Uh, you don't know it, but you owe a lot to him. And to many of them, uh, Alfred McCormick was hospitalized, I think. William Friedman also succumbed, and they were hospitalized from overexertion, from just working that hard. And, you know, it's ironic, too, that Stimson was a proponent. Stimson, as Secretary of State, had closed what was called the Cipher Bureau, and he famously said, gentlemen do not read each other's mail. That changed with the Second World War. So there was a recognition by policymakers that intelligence was going to be increasingly important, not just during the war, but after the war. And in fact, you know, you, you discussed this a little bit, but the post-war intelligence system was debated, I mean, during the, what, 1942, OSS was already writing policy papers about what the post-war system would look like. And there's a lot of hemming and hawing and bureaucratic competition. And, you know, you talk about need to know, but coordination was a massive problem, particularly when it came to signals intelligence. So maybe you can talk us through the, the just the, environment of tension, bureaucratic competition between intelligence organizations, between the Army, the Navy, the Americans, and the British? So, um, you know, a lot of, lot of things going on here. And, and one of them is what we've been talking about, and that's 
uh, how good the signals intelligence is. And maybe I should say happens to be because it didn't have to be that way. You know, they could have they could have run out of, you, you know, they, they could have hit a, a, a stone wall and not broken the Japanese code, and then we'd be having a different conversation. But anyway, the, the um, so signals intelligence is the, um, I don't know, drug is too strong a word, but it's the, it's the diet that the, that the thinking leaders, people like uh, George C. Marshall, come to appreciate most. And so everything else kind of takes second place. And, uh, and, and so you've got Donovan who's saying, hey, you, you need, you need a, a central intelligence organization, uh, all lowercase. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, I guess I do, but, but I've got this other thing, uh, which you can't see, by the way. Uh, I'll tell you it exists, but I'm, I'm not going to share it with you. Uh, and so uh, at the end of the war, uh, once you you take the uh, fighting the Japanese and the the Germans off the table, it's like this. It's, it's like the energies redirected against each other, and Washington, the the, the various uh, forces fight against each other. Uh, they agree there has to be some kind of um, intelligence organization after the war, uh, but they can't agree what it's going to be, where it's going to be, how much power it's going to have. Uh, State Department tries to uh, take it. Uh, FBI says, uh, we'll do it all. Don't worry. We'll do internal, external, uh, nothing to see here, folks. Just move along. We'll take care of it for you. Um, President Truman uh, is actually uh, one of the adults in the room, and he says, we, you know, uh, we, have to, we have to get this organized. He, he, you know, it takes a couple years to get it done right, but, but he, he kind of tamps down the food fight, and and starts it on a more productive road. And so that's, you know, the, the trajectory over the course of the war, uh, how intelligence, as you said, it, the rise of American intelligence really started in the Second World War. But what started intelligence in the Second World War? You mentioned that there wasn't an intelligence profession at the beginning. Um, where did the decision come from to start an organization? You mentioned the coordinator of information, the antecedent of the OSS. Uh, how did the United States actually get the ball rolling on intelligence? Uh, there's one word, London. Uh, so the Brits, I start the book in uh, 1940 with the fall of France. And uh, that means that the Brits are all that's left between us and Hitler. And uh, you know, in 1940, there's, uh, in the summer of 1940, there's talk that Britain's going to fall. And so the, the um, Churchill realizes that the only uh, hope he's got is to involve America in the war. And part of that is for the Americans to create an intelligence organization that the Brits can liaise with. And also, uh, he also realizes that uh, America has all these resources, so not only liaison, but dollars. Uh, so uh, they send um, a, a, a teams of, of men over. Uh, the British intelligence, is like there's an intelligence base in New York, and uh, it probably had around 1,000 officers uh, or, and, and employees of various sorts. I mean, those of you who've been overseas and seen a CIA station know that it is never in the thousands. Uh, and it's much closer to the real little end. Uh, so, um, and these guys, these guys are running ops against the Americans. Uh, it's like, it's, it's covert action. Uh, they buy newspaper, um, you know, they insert articles in, in newspapers. They buy radio stations. Uh, they try to embarrass uh, isolationist politicians. They try to build up interventionist politicians. And, and Donovan's one of the things that, they, they, that catches their eye, and, and they, they think he would make a good uh, intelligence chief, and they start promoting him. They look at J. Edgar Hoover first, and they decide, no, mm, too bureaucrat, too bureaucratic. He's, not, he doesn't, he's, got, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good manager of, uh, of the FBI, uh, but it's not the vision they're looking for. And so they shift to Donovan. Donovan wants to go and do special ops. Donovan doesn't want to do, doesn't want to necessarily run an intel organization. He wants to do special ops. And the Brits basically say, no, uh, your job right now is to start the U.S. down this road. And he eventually agrees. And he keeps saying, but as soon as I get it started, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go, go do special ops. Uh, and, um, but but the, the short answer to your question is, it's the Brits. They are absolutely desperate. 
Um, they, have, they have broken the glass. Uh, they have uh, sounded the alarm. And I, I, I kind of struggle with this in my own head and in the book. Um, so do we really want, do, you know, you don't want a foreign power coming over and, and um, you, you don't want to be the victim of covert action. And, uh, you know, uh, in this case, I can't really blame the Brits because um, they were, they, they, it was an existential threat. Uh, it's a little, little bit like being Ukrainian. Do you want Putin to kill you on the battlefield or would you like, to kill, like him to kill you after you surrender? Uh, and that's sort of the way the, the uh, British feel. And, um, you know, I guess if I were, if I were a British uh, politician or an intelligence officer and I had to offend some Americans because I had taken, at, taken an ad or bought a, rail, uh, a, a radio station, that's too bad. It's, it, in this case, it was worth it. And it took more than the British. Uh, FDR, there's competing ideas in the literature of intelligence history about just what sort of intelligence manager, just how keenly interested FDR was. He had a history with intelligence in the First World War with the Navy. Um, and supposedly he cultivated uh, this small intelligence network during the 1930s, uh, the, the club led by Vincent Astor. So what was FDR's role in starting the American intelligence enterprise during the Second World War? So I, I mixed. Um, and uh, FDR called himself the juggler. And, and he said, I got a set of balls in one hand, a set of balls in the other hand, and I just, I just keep them moving. And uh, my take on FDR and intelligence is intelligence was somebody added one more ball and that was intelligence, and he was just going to keep it moving. So he's not the he's he's not the great organizer. He's not the okay. You know, this is the, you know we need three of these and two of those, and and um, we need somebody in charge, overall charge. It was more like here's another here's another interest that I am going to satisfy, uh, and that's that's consistent with what he did before the war. His idea of intelligence was talking. One-on-one uh, -on -one with somebody he trusted, ideally someone uh, who had the same background as he did, um, you know, Harvard, Yale, um, maybe Princeton, uh, certainly not uh, a, a university on the West Coast, uh, and um, you know, he, and he would. It was. It was more like. It was more like polit politically useful information was his idea of intelligence. So, so tell me something I need to know about Hitler that I can use in my next speech. That was kind of his approach to intelligence. It wasn't, it wasn't we need to get this organized. Uh, I, I, I credit Truman with the, that second position, it, the, <coughs> the let's get something organized position. So what was the relationship then between Donovan and Roosevelt? Because one of the curious things Donovan, uh, Roosevelt does is he appoints Donovan the COI. Did, and that then eventually becomes the OSS, provides the roots for the foundation of the CIA in the long term. Uh, but it doesn't sound from what you're telling us that he intended it to go that far. So how did, how did you know, what started out as uh, this, this smaller enterprise, Donovan had a grand design in his head. Roosevelt said, yes, yes, go ahead and do it. How did that progress, and how did the relationship between the two progress during the course of the war? Well, it's, it, you know, there's a push-pull the whole time between, between we've got to do this and we've got to do it in, in uh, uh, an organized way. Uh, before the war, so before we get into the war more precisely, uh, Donovan is welcomed, welcome to be one of these one of these balls. He's the core, they call it the coordinator inf of information. Uh, and and uh, Roosevelt kind of gives in to pressure to create this. And, and, he, and when he, on the same day as he creates it, he, he holds a press conference and he, he seems to be taking away what he just gave. Uh, and so once the war starts, uh, he's, a lot, he's a lot busier and he, he's not against Donovan, but he doesn't have that much time for Donovan. And Donovan himself says, okay, um, you know, we'd be better off somewhere else, not in the White House structure. So he's, he's, he's part of the executive branch initially. So think of uh, today there's the office, OMB, Office of Management and Budget. And he's kind of under that initially. And um, <clears throat> he thinks, and I think rightly, that he's better off doing something with the military. So uh, he appeals to uh, Marshall 
and uh, Beadle Smith, who's the Secretary of the Joint Chiefs uh, at that time, and uh, gets OSS um, parked under them. And uh, again, Roosevelt says, "Okay, boys, you know, bring me the bring me the document, and I'll I'll sign it." And and Roosevelt kind of steps back at that point. So he's and and the the primary relationship between um, that that uh, Donovan has is with the military from from that point forward. He's, he can still see the president occasionally, and you know the president likes people. The the D-Day story I told. Uh, so um, in my world, so you come back to Washington, you get the uh, reprimand of your life, and maybe you get fired because I told you not to do that, and you did it, uh, and you work for me. Sort of that. That's what Truman would have done and did. Um, but instead, he goes. Donovan is a, is a political creature, and he makes sure that he can go to the White House and tell this wonderful story of what it was like on the beach and how the Germans came over and they shot at him, and, uh, you know, and he lived to tell the story. So, so um, you know, Ro Roosevelt still thinks of Donovan as somebody who, who he can have a good chat with, um, but it's not professional intelligence. There's something in there that uh, I wanted to discuss in light of JSAL, its relationship with SOCOM, SOCOM's relationship with intelligence. Uh, we have a colleague here, David Oakley, who's written a book called Subordinating Intelligence. And you really do see this drive to subordinate intelligence even during the Second World War. In some ways, this is a self-inflicted wound of Donovan by nesting COI then in, in under JCS's OSS. But there was still tension there. So what was the relationship between the different elements of the military, Army, Navy, for instance, uh, their leadership, Donovan, and then this just strange organization that's trying to do everything, special operations, morale and propaganda, research and analysis, even have a map room in the White, uh, somewhere near the White House that FDR can see for a couple million bucks. <laughs> well, um, so my... Uh, my conclusion is that that um, you know Donovan does some great things, but he sort of talks himself out of a job or, or or gets himself put on the sidelines because of because of his approach to uh, how it's managed. Uh, you for, take a one example is Jed Berg's. So Donovan loves Donovan loves Jed Berg's ops groups, parachute in, um, kill Germans, uh, ideally get out. Um, but in, for up until 1944, uh, OSS is very clearly the junior partner. So uh, somebody from OSS, <coughs> special operator, goes to Britain to do special ops. He's going to SOE. And so you find I'm working on, a, I'm doing a, an article on a, a, one of the guys uh, um, who was a special operator. And his personnel file is an SOE file. And uh, you know you you've got a, a he does have an OSS file uh, as well, but he's got an SOE personnel file. And if you read the uh, official histories of the war, you would think the British official histories of special ops, uh, um, MRD foot, uh, like uh, it's SOE in France, and there's one there's one other. You would think that it everything that happened in France was SOE. Well, and that's that goes to this convergence and weird divergence between intelligence and special operations. You know, it sounds like from what you're saying, uh, the U.S. didn't exactly manage that tension well, and it's still a tension today. And, you know, we're, we're seeing it as we enter what we're calling here the fourth age of soft, four, fourth age of special operations. So, you know, looking back as far as best practices that you saw between intelligence and special operations, did they work together at all? Did analysis help advance, for instance, Jedburgh operations in France, or was it just you know, near and distant neighbors in the same building who didn't really get along? Probably closer to near and distant uh, neighbors. So in it, OS, OSS London had a, uh, a special ops branch and they had a secret intelligence branch. And the secret intelligence branch did some of the th same things. They parachuted guys, parachuted small teams into France. And they were there. They were there with with requirements. Um, it, an, an idea that is very undonovan. Undonovan says you find an opportunity, you exploit it. And uh, the guy who was running the the um, SI part said we have requirements. You know, we're going to send them to look for, 
you know, this German division or whatnot. And they were moderately successful, so they found some, some German units that they reported on. Uh, the, the other side, sort of the Jedbergs, were far more combat oriented, uh, and so they were there to liaise with the, the French resistance and, and to attack specific targets. Did they ever provide meaningful intelligence? Yeah. But that wasn't their primary mission, and, and I, I think if you had any of them sitting here, they'd say, um, you know, that I, I'll do that if I have time, but my first thing to do, the first thing I need to do is arm these French guys and, and blow up that bridge and, and uh, attack, attack this German. So that's the relationship then within the OSS and also between intelligence and special operations. How did either of those or both of them work within this larger conventional military picture that's going on? Um, you know, the invasion of France both from the north and south with Normandy and D-Day and then Dragoon. Uh, was there any cooperation, collaboration with so, them? So there, I have to take a footnote and, and, and go, go down this, to what I just said. So um, one of the things that Donovan saw after, after D-Day was that there was a gap. It wasn't a gap in, in, in uh, operations and collection. It wasn't a gap that anybody had really foreseen. Uh, and it was sort of, it was a, uh, somewhere between the tactical and the operational, sort of like, like uh, 15, 20 miles out. Uh, and one way to fill that was line crossers. So you had a, you had a French uh, milkman, let's say, and, and uh, he had customers on both sides of the uh, FIBA, and he could cross. I mean, it was like, oh yeah, it's just the milkman, let him go. And, and so uh, the, the uh, Eisenhower's units, uh, the army units there were, were not comfortable dealing with people like a French milkman. And OSS kind of was. And, uh, and so Donovan says, go, go fill that gap. Uh, and uh, you know, as far as I can tell, it was reasonably successful. Um, they, you know, they, did, they did come back, not with strategic intelligence, but they came back with this, this kind of hybrid, like the, the, you know, the, there's, there's the German division over there, or, or you know, the German Corps headquarters is, is over here. So that, that's kind of the, the, the hybrid uh, success story that OSS brought home. And then looking at how that changed over the course of the war and into the post-war period, uh, you mentioned, you know, alluded to Truman gets rid of Donovan. Why does he get rid of the OSS? And, and I know, you know, you, you start bridging this history, and I also know that you're very familiar with the post-war environment, um, even though it's a little bit beyond the scope of the book. Uh, what happens to the OSS after, and then how do you get from OSS to CIA? Uh, so one of the things to remember about OSS is there's, there's basically two categories of people working there. One are uniformed military who've been detailed from mostly the Army, but not exclusively. Uh, there's some Navy, there's, there's some Marines. Um, very few Air Corps, as far as I know. Uh, but anyway, uh, so uh, at the end of the war, it's, it's like they're either going to be demobilized or sent back to their parent service. Uh, and then there's, there's civilian OSS employees, and so there's, there's, this, um, there's this pressure for them uh, to, it, it, and Truman politically is facing a lot of pressure basically to demobilize after VG, VJ Day. And uh, OSS falls into that box and it's, it's part of, it. yes, it's a little bit rushed, um, but there's, there's two things going on here. One is they don't want Donovan anymore. Uh, the other is uh, this demobilization. Uh, and at the same time, he's keeping some of these units, some parts of OSS, uh, more or less intact. Uh, uh, research and analysis goes to the State Department. Uh, special ops and special secret intelligence go to the Department of War. Uh, they go, they, if, if you actually worked in OSS, yeah, you'd notice that there were a lot fewer uniforms, um, uh, but the same guy might be in charge. General Magruder, uh, who was uh, Donovan's deputy, is in charge of um, this, the, the SI and SO remnants. Uh, and those, so as the, uh, the post-war period progresses, um, you know, these, these um, kind of grow back up. And Army intelligence plays a big role here. The, um, um, the guys who are, who are uh, some of the OSS guys get uh, folded in with uh, Army intelligence in, in Germany. And, and so, so we're talking the end of the war here. 
um, you know, in 45, 46, and whatnot. A great book by a, a colleague of mine who's an Army historian called Covert Legions that uh, speaks directly to this, what happens after the war, you know, where do, where do these wartime spies go, uh, what are they doing um, after the war? So you see OSS guys, you see uniformed um, Army intelligence guys. General Magruder, I should mention, so Nick, um, aside from being a extremely good researcher, the book is full of primary source research. Nick did a lot of work to actually get the documents. Um, and Nick's generously shared you know, with me, he directed me with a lot of the research too. And I found a letter that uh, General Magruder wrote, and this was just at, you know, the OSS and its death thro throws, he's going to be appointed uh, to lead SSU. And, you know, Magruder was basically saying, we did something here with the OSS that hasn't been done before in U.S. history and is still desperately needed. And that sort of Donovan dream stays alive with some of his, you know, the OSS acolytes. And they're able to carry it through in spite of the resistance of big army, big navy, um, to some extent, State Department, Bureau of Budget, who all wanted to dis extinguish it. So, you know, even though Donovan's gone, why does the Truman administration, why does the United States do something that had heretofore been unprecedented and decide we need a central intelligence organization of some type? So part of it is the, the uh, lessons learned from the war. It's sort of a, you know, it's like, like you go on an exercise and then you have the hot wash. And so they're kind of doing this at the end of 1945 in, uh, in Washington and, and there's, there's, there is this uh, feeling that I mentioned earlier that we, yeah, we need some kind of, of central intelligence agency, but there is a, there's a, uh, one thing that gives it some urgency, and uh, that is atomic weapons. So Admiral Leahy, who is uh, 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 Fleet Admiral Leahy, five stars, um, he's, he's the guy, look in, look in pictures of, of World War II conferences, and it'll be a, a senior naval officer in the background he, he never, he's never up front. He's always like two or three rows back. And uh, he is sort of the combination of uh, national security uh, advisor. Uh, he's sort of chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He's sort of the senior military officer in the United States. And he's generally unacknowledged. Uh, and he's also the, um, both Roosevelt and Truman have a personal relationship with him and uh, listen to him. Uh, he's written his own memoirs, which are, uh, exceedingly dull, but there's some nuggets in there <laughs> for historians. And he says one very important thing. He says, we cannot afford an atomic Pearl Harbor. He hates atomic weapons. He th he li he's a big battleship guy. He likes, you know, putting a, a conventional round in that, in that uh, big old uh, thing and, and slamming it shut and, and pulling the lanyard. And, and, and he's, initially, he's, he's, he refuses to believe atomic weapons are going to make any difference, but after uh, VJ Day, he says, yeah, and we can't afford this, can't afford to let this happen to us. So we're not looking at the Soviets yet. It's sort of a more general theoretical thing. And that's one of the, that's one of the things that, that keeps the idea of intelligence alive after uh, central intelligence alive after World War II. The other thing is signals intelligence. So, so this, it, 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 you know, during the war, um, so the Army and the Navy, so the, the, um, uh, they, they probably would have said uh, um, in 1940 that uh, the enemy was the other service, the opposition was uh, the foreign element they were both targeting. Uh, so by 1945, they kind of sort of work together. They have a couple of forums uh, where they meet and talk about requirements and, and resources. And the other thing's the Brits, again. So the uh, British uh, signals intelligence in World War II is a, is a huge success story. And it's got a great consumer, by the way. It's got a great client, uh, Winston Churchill, uh, who wants to read the raw stuff and the analysis, right? Every day in the morning, he opens his own red box. You don't hand it to him. You leave it. He opens it. He reads it. Um, so this relationship with the Brits grows up in the signals intelligence side. Uh, on the signals intelligence side in World War II, uh, and, it, and, and the Brits are, are uh, they drive part of the, the um, unification between the Army and the Navy, because they said, we're tired. What they used to have to do, they'd come to Washington, they'd have one set of meetings, 
to discuss an issue with the Army. Then the next day they would discuss the same issue with the Navy because the two didn't want to be in the same conference room at the same time. And so the Brits basically say, you guys, we don't want to do this anymore. We're, it's a waste of time. All three of us need to be in the conference room at the same time. And so while this big organization, the food fight's going on about central intelligence, signals intelligence just kind of, they, 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 there's a little memo that goes to Truman, and it's kind of like, well, can we continue doing what we were doing during the war? And oh, by the way, can we fold the British in? And it's a, it's a shoulder shrug. It's, it, this goes back to what I said earlier about, um, you know, signals intelligence is the, is, is the star. Um, you know, I, somewhere I think I called it the king of the intelligence battlefield. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's, that's one of the things. So the, the, there's two streams going into the post-war. So there's, there's signals intelligence and there's this argument about central intelligence. And it's, it, it's kind of interesting. So it's, it's central intelligence sort of without s signals intelligence is going to stay over here and central intelligence is going to be over here. And that's fantastic because you see that um, someone recently wrote an article, Rafael Ramos, uh, about the origins of the intelligence diarchy between Secretary of Defense and the assets Secretary of Defense controls and what had been DCI, Director of Central Intelligence. Um, and so the origins of that lie else in the Second World War. I want to leave plenty of time for you to interact with our audience because I know they'll have plenty of questions uh, for you. But, you know, you do say in the start of the book, and I want to reemphasize, you know, this is a deeply researched but also very accessible book. And you promise a 30,000 foot view of American intelligence, so a big picture view. So what would be the big picture takeaway that you really want audiences to have from reading Need to Know? So that's one right there that we, we um, just touched on. Um, as we used to say at Naval War College, no cat is so flat that it can't be run over one more time. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, the, the signals intelligence um, comes, is, is, the, is the star. Um, and you know OSS is is a supporting plays a supporting role. Um, professionalization is I think one of the big one of the big things you see here. So we go from we go from um, really sort of amateur status before the war, and by the end of the war we've got we've got some real um, intelligence professionals there. Um, what else do I do you see in the big picture? And then you then you 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 know you. I think you could teach a college course on this, so you can you you can go down. You can look. We don't talk very much about counterintelligence, but you could you could um, teach a segment, at least a class on counterintelligence here, because you know uh, uh, Hoover brings along. Uh, uh, he grows his service during the war. Uh, it gets to be roughly the same size as the OSS, by the way, uh, around around thirteen thousand. Uh, and he, he his service grows as a counterintelligence service. Um, but it doesn't grow as an intelligence service, as, a, as FI. So it does CI, but not uh, FI. So you could, you could ask questions about, um, you know, where, where do you want to park FI? What, what uh, bright lines would you like to have between CI and FI? But the, the big ones are the sort of the, the you know, you, you grow. We start with nothing, and at the end of the war, we have all these capabilities, and we keep them. So that's that's one major takeaway. The professionalization is um, is yet another, and then and then you can talk about you know what what kind of intelligence do you want a, a, a society to have? And with those takeaways, I'd, I'd really like to open it up and hear what the audience says, what questions they have for Nick, please. Yeah, go ahead. Well, that's that, that's a great question. Um, so I I think um, crises, big crises, um, push them in that direction. So Pearl Harbor, 9/11, um, uh, and it's never going to be perfect. So I like to say that you know, a, that's the nature of the intelligence beast, right? You, you're, you're dealing with unknowns. So um, you you it's like I go halfway to that first row of seats, right? The first few steps are going to be pretty dramatic. And then each succeeding halfway is going to be less dramatic. And uh, I like to think of it, at, at the growth of intelligence as a profession, kind of in, in that way that we, 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 keep, we keep getting towards uh, the goal, but we're never going to fully reach it because of the nature of the beast.
so I have I have no clearances right now, <clears throat> and um, I I'm reading the newspaper like everyone else. I would guess the answer is yes. I mean, if and if I were a foreign power, uh, if I were Russia or China, uh, you bet I'd have a big uh, CA uh, capability or, or want one. Uh, so um, I can't give you details because I just don't know. But um, you know that that would be that might be something we learn from from World War II initially. Uh, so there's a chapter in here on Alan Dulles, and and he runs this. Uh, he's He's in Switzerland uh, in uh, World War II, and he's so he's surrounded by Axis territory, right? So he's like a he's like an island in in a, a sea of uh, in an enemy sea, and he runs like two or three kinds of different operations, uh, including a, a covert action or two, and and it's like he's it's it's like a, it's like a little test bed. It's like hmm, how far can I do this? You know, so so I I think at the end of the war. Uh, he is one of the guys who's saying to himself, you know, there's, there's a lot here that we need to develop in the post-war period. The story goes a couple ways. So when, when uh, <clears throat> he was fired, <clears throat> so he gets fired like, he, he knows he's going to be, the, the last day, uh, is the last Friday in September 1945. They close the doors, uh, and he finds out like like earlier in the month. And so at night, he and one of his aides copy as many OSS documents as they can. And uh, you know this is not just um, uh, this this isn't just like a hearsay. Um, somebody at the National Archives has looked at the film. The film is now in the National Archives, and you see. Donovan's fingerprints and those of his assistant as they copy maybe 50 rolls of, they, they work really hard, uh, 50 rolls of secret documents. And that goes to his uh, office in New York. It's in, it's in a law firm. It's Donovan Leisure in New York. Uh, so talk about, you know, the, the, gosh, um, it's the, you know, it's the, 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 things never change, right? A, a senior officer taking taking uh, taking documents home um, but he doesn't take the originals home mm -hmm. and the originals have a, a, a complicated history of going so first they go to the, the War Department uh, and then they go to CIA and eventually CIA gives everything to the National Archives and I'm I'm confident that like 99 percent of OSS documents are in the National Archives and accessible Sometimes you won't find, uh, you'll go looking for a personnel document, so uh, like a 201 file for an employee, and sometimes it'll be gone. And uh, you have to wonder, did somebody pull it? You know, was it a conspiracy? Probably not. Uh, was it somebody who said, uh, I want to keep that file in my office because I had a personal relationship with that person? Um, I think that happened in a couple cases. So um, I think Donovan gave himself that hope. He hoped that he could um, rely. It, it's like the it, it's like the parent who who doesn't say yes or no, but kind of smiles and nods uh, when, you know, can I have a new car or rifle or whatever, and the parent goes, mm, yeah. And, and that, 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 so Donovan interprets that attitude as I'm in a good place. Uh, and uh, he is very upset when uh, Roosevelt dies in April uh, 1945. Uh, and and he's, he's almost, He's, he, for a few hours, he's almost catatonic. He says, "This is this is the end of everything." But if you if you peel back a couple layers, so there's a, a memo that Roosevelt signed that said, "Hey, we need to have a meeting. We we need to get this all in order." Um, you know, there's this memo that Donovan's written, and and we all need to sit down and 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 puzzle out what uh, post-war intelligence is going to look like. Well, who was that memo written by? Drafted by Donovan, and so Donovan slipped it into. Uh, into the White House, he had a couple of, of, of people who would talk to him and 
and they put it in front of the president. So it was kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, Roosevelt had never really said, we're going to get this set up for you, um, but Donovan chose to believe it. Well, I mean, if you look at CIA, early CIA and, and um, OSS, you find a lot of the same. I mean, you find you, you find a lot of disciplines under one roof, and, and and you find a lot of the same people. Not not everybody, but you know, a lot of the a lot of the seniors start with with OSS. Um, but I tell you, one thing you you would have found would have been uh, eighteen to twenty um, Soviet spies. Uh, who were in, uh, oh, the guy filling Donovan's inbox was reporting to the Soviets. And this wasn't, this wasn't a good thing. You don't want to have your employees uh, having their own foreign policy, especially a secret foreign policy. Um, and, but after the war, it would have made a huge difference. And, you know, and this, this, this guy, uh, um, Duncan Lee was his name. And uh, Duncan Lee, uh, Rhodes Scholar, descendant of Robert E. Lee, uh, uh, law firm, uh, Donovan's law firm, and, and just sort of a bright young man. And uh, his wife was a communist, and she basically uh, guided him um, over to the party, and the, the party said, you're going to be in the secret branch of the party, and that turned into, you're going to be a spy. And he would memorize, he would, he would decide what Donovan was going to read in the morning, <laughs> Uh, and he would, he was a, a smart guy, so he's not going to carry a briefcase full of classified out. He would memorize what he thought were the most important documents, and then he would go and meet with his handler, uh, you know, a place like uh, um, Martin's Tavern in Georgetown, and, and he would dictate word for word uh, what he had memorized. And so now, with, uh, do you all know what Venona is? So it's the decrypt. Um, that that um, so we we intercepted Soviet uh, messages during the war and we decrypted a bunch of them and so you can see the same document. You go to National Archives, get the document as it went into uh, Donovan's inbox, and you can see the decrypt uh, in the Venona. So this guy had a phenomenal memory. So one one consequence would have been you would have had a CIA with a lot of with the CIA, the the Soviets would have had a head start. Let's just put it that way. Um, you know, otherwise, would it have been a whole lot different? I, I don't know. Um, you know. One thing you could ask is, if what, what if CIA had grown up, or OSS had grown up like the British services, right? The British services are not, they're not product, they're not wartime product. Uh, you know, they go back to the turn of the century, and and they they also come from a sort of a homogenous society. These guys all go to school together. They serve in the same regiments. Uh, you know, their fathers and mothers had known each other, and, and so you, you, you have a much more uh, cohesive group running intelligence in, in London, and it's sort of a, there seems to be a, um, an assumption that this is how things should be, right? That this is just, it's, it's a function of government, it's just a routine function of government. Uh, and we grow up in the war, so there's this there's this, um, this kind of urgency about it, right? You gotta, you, you, we had to do these things to win the war. So would we have been better off? Would we have had more organic growth if we'd been like the Brits? Or, um, you know, are we better off the way, the way we are when, you know, we, it, it's, it's, a, it's an instrument that you use in um, special circumstances? I don't know. Okay. I, I still I struggle with that one, and and who and also you could you could ask me, do we want to be like the Brits, right? So 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 why did the Soviets do such a good job against the Brits? Because uh, in 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 the in the Cold War period, it's because um, nobody's going to suspect Kim Philby because he's got the right accent. You know, he's known the he's been to the right university. Uh, he knows all the right people. Um, so maybe I don't know. It's a complicated. Complicated question, though I, I think you can make the argument that a slow peacetime development would have been better than the America model, where it's Jeff and his Jeff's book's coming out soon, right? Wonderful book. Uh, the whole uh, I haven't read it all. I'll be, uh, but I've, I've read a lot of it. And so the, there's there's this part where where um, you know American intelligence, George Washington has intelligence. War's over, 
sent them home. Uh, War of 1812, uh, Civil War, World War I, every time we sent them home. And you know, only after World War II do we keep them around. And what if we had not sent them home? What if we had, what if we had just um, grown little by little uh, for 200 years, you know, would we have been in a better place? And there were people like Donovan, um, Henry Shelton Sanford and William Sword in the Civil War, Robert Lansing and um, uh, William McAdoo during the First World War who proposed that we need to coordinate and centralize intelligence. But each time they ran against some of the same obstacles that, that Donovan, that some of the forward thinkers in the Second World War did. I think, you know, what you've done too, Nick, is you've contextualized just how uh, sometimes, you know, in history just this confluence of history, circumstances come together and you have alignment between policymakers, mm -hmm. bureaucratic organizations, remarkable individuals, and the global threat environment. And finally, it came to the nuclear age, it came together in the Second yeah. World War in a way that you could not go. There was a, you know, a real recognition. And I, I should also mention, so Nick uh, pointed me towards the Bureau of Budget did a remarkable job. They didn't like Donovan, they didn't like the OSS. And early in my research, um, and I had met Nick, he said, go look at the Bureau of Budget Records. And they are a treasure trove on the OSS and Donovan. And you know, what you see is even the recalcitrant people, there was a recognition over the course of the Second World War, we can't do what we've done in the past. And, and, and so, you know, again, n Nick really does establish how the record completely changed with the Second World War. I, I saw we had another question too. Yes, sir. So great, great, uh, great question. I'll, I'll, I'll tell a, a short sea story. Uh, I used to go to the SMH meetings and I, re I remember an SMH meeting, mm, late 90s, and they gave an award to somebody who had written the Vietnamese side of the war in Vietnam. And you see all these guys in the, in the room going, mm, you know, because we, we had written, uh, I'm guilty too, we, we had written history from our own side. Um, the German side, the Japanese side is, is um, you know, there's some technical, they, they're good at, at some technical things, or, you know, traffic analysis, things like that. But they, they don't seem to have, um, they don't seem to be really good at, at putting it together, at going beyond the, um, the tactical level. And there's, there's one or two books on the subject. It's, it's one that hasn't been uh, studied a lot. Uh, the German side has been uh, studied a lot. Um, David Kahn, who was uh, one of my mentors, uh, wrote a book called Hitler's Spies. And there's, um, you know, there's, there's any number of, of books um, out there uh, about the Germans, uh, they tend to, they had some, some major successes, um, but they, they, it's kind of the same story as the Japanese. They, they're not as good at, at, at pulling it together and making, um, you know, coming, coming up with a, a, a really big picture. So like they had, they had um, in uh, SOE operations in Holland, uh, they turned uh, the SOE operators, um, you know, they captured them, they tortured them, they had them um, transmit back, and they kept that going for uh, months, if not years, uh, and, and just fed false information to the Brits, and the Brits, the Brits lapped it up. So the Germans could be very, very good at this, um, but they, 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 they didn't get the whole, so the, the I, I'm, I'm, maybe the Brits brainwashed me, but, I mean, they, they, so t take an example of uh, deception, um, which is really a British art in World War II, and it starts in the desert when they don't have enough troops. So they, they try and make the Germans think they have one-third more than they have. So not a huge amount, but just, yeah, you know, there's another battalion there. And, um, and when they, the desert campaign's over, one of the guys says, you know, we created these units. Why don't we keep them? So uh, they, while D-Day's building up, uh, you know, and the, the fighting in, in, in Italy and, and, and uh, whatnot, they're augmenting these units, right? There's a new commander, there's a change of command. Um, they come up with patches. Uh, you know, they come up with an order of battle. Uh, you know, here's the, this guy's in the three shop. And, you know, the Germans are lapping this stuff up. 
and, and so the Germans are good at, at, at sort of following this, but they don't realize that it's a trick. And so, uh, you know, there's, a, there's still some... some yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's why you need them all. That's what, that's that's one of the takeaways I I hope here. But but you're so so the answer is um, the Germans aren't quite as good as the Germans are good at some things, but they're not as as good globally. And of course, their ultimate consumer is a nut, right? I mean, he's just um, just a, he's, he is a terrible consumer, right? He's got his own own uh, um, fixed ideas of how the world should be and. If you're not in, on the same wavelength, you're wasting your time. So, um, you know, did did the D-Day deception work? Um, there's books. I mean, like four, I can think of four or five books uh, written about it. But one thing I would insist on, and that is that the Germans believed consistently that there's a whole lot more American and British and Canadian troops that could come over. And so, whether they believed exactly this deception or that deception. There is this thing at the back of their minds, like, we got to be careful because they're so much stronger. Sir. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt on Five Eyes because that's, that's outside my, my um, bailiwick. But SOE, OSS, um, interesting relationship. Uh, so, so Donovan starts early on going to uh, SOE and saying, uh, you know, we want to be like you. And, uh, and, and so and they, the SOE eats this up. It's like, you, you know, you're, 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 you're telling me my baby's beautiful, and I already know that, but it's always good to hear. And, <laughs> and so they, they're condescending, they're a little bit manipulative. Um, they work together fairly successfully through um, through D-Day, and then uh, after that, OSS says, "I want to do some stuff on my own," and it is specifically um, uh, putting um, uh, agents, uh, operators into Germany. And uh, SOE says that's too difficult, and OSS says, "We don't we don't care what you think. We're going to do it ourselves." And, it, and they're also in the in the in the Balkans, uh, OSS and SOE have serious clashes on on how to do that. Um, but but basically, it's a it's a, a, a it's almost like a parent-child relationship, and then the child grows up and eventually leaves home. So I'm, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to punt on part two because the you know, CIA gets gets upset with me when I comment on on uh, events that I'm. You know, and I, and again, I have I have no knowledge beyond what I would have read in in the paper. I, um, yeah, I think it's a it's a terrible thing. One thing I would say though is is um, you know the fact I get I got asked a couple times so. You know, what about this case or that case? Doesn't that prove that uh, intelligence is still broken? Uh, broken in World War II, stayed broken, and, and whatnot, especially counterintelligence. I guess my answer to that is I'd have to ask what the organization did to protect itself. Um, you know, if they did nothing, if they were like, if they had no protocols, like I mentioned earlier, Frank Rowlett, there were no clearances, right? Uh, then I'd be pretty upset. But you're you're going to lose a few, no matter what you do. So I guess the question is, uh, how good are you, how good's your system? And if one or two get through, well, um, that's the cost of doing business. Uh, the uh, so mincemeat. Uh, so there's a British. Um, there's a bunch of books on mincemeat. Um, the most recent one is Ben McIntyre. I can't remember what he called it, but Ben Ben McIntyre is like this one man uh, Intel history shop, and just he. <laughs> He churns out one great book after another. Um, so my understanding, min mincemeat is not a central part of this story, um, but it, it, it is kind of a, a footnote or a, a sidebar. And my understanding is that mincemeat was uh, overwhelmingly a British operation uh, in an allied command. Uh, and it succeeded not because it was perfect, but because it was better than the Germans, right? Better so so 
what Ben McIntyre shows is that uh, this corpse, so the, ba the basic story is the, 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 the Brits uh, found a, a, got a corpse out of their hospital system, dressed it up as a Royal Marine officer, uh, uh, handcuffed a briefcase full of secret, supposedly secret documents showing that they were going to go in a different direction from the one they actually went, and, and then uh, launched it from a submarine and the, the uh, ostensible story was a plane had crashed, and, and so he washes ashore in, I can't remember, Spain or Portugal, I think Spain, right? Uh, and and uh, uh, the doctor, the regular doctor in that little town is on vacation, and there's this big doctor from Madrid who comes in, and he's an expert on drowning, and he goes, mm, I don't think this guy drowned. I think he was dead before he hit the water. <laughs> And that's kind of that's kind of odd in this case, uh, but uh, you know, as the as the case develops, the Germans don't pick up on this. So it's not a perfect deception, but it's a good enough deception. And so I guess that's that's sort of my takeaway here is you don't have to be perfect; you have to be better than the other guy. I, you know, you could, you could look at, um, you could look at morale operations and and the continuum in World War II between, uh, like the sort of the Voice of America, um, you know, public public diplomacy approach, and then you know going all the way to black propaganda on the other end, and uh, OSS kind of manages to own um, black propaganda. Uh, and in the CIA museum, we had stuff like uh, um, you had a, a stamp that uh, the OSS introduced into the German postal system, and uh, so it's it, at first glance it looks like the, your normal. Most of the stamps in, in the Third Reich were Hitler, right? Portrait of Hitler. Well, you look at this one, and it, it's got like Hitler as a as a as a skull, right? So did we win the war because of that? Was it coordinated with anybody? I doubt it. Um, so I, yeah, I think that's a great, uh, that, that's, a, that's a, a really rich topic that you raise and, and I, I hope somebody, maybe somebody in this room um, is going to take it on because it's a, it's, it's, it's it, some, there's, I would, I would want to see at least some goalposts, right? And, and even in World War II there was like, okay, you're going to operate here, you're going to do this kind of thing, uh, you're going to do that kind of thing. and I. I hope that's going to happen uh, today. I, I should mention that because you've said as much to me. Um, you, you know, you mentioned one of your interests, uh, David Kahn, who wrote the book on code breaking, the code breakers, uh, and Sigint. You know, you mentioned, and he's in the book William Friedman, and there is some continuity there with cyber because cyber is largely passed to the NSA, which before was the Army Service, the SIS. Um, under Friedman and before that the Cypher Bureau. So there's there's kind of a bit of continuity there. Um, maybe you're teasing the next book here. <laughs> maybe. So so Friedman, Friedman's kind of a hero of mine because he's, he's um, uh, you know, he's the out, something of an outsider. Uh, he's born in Russia, the Russian Empire, happens to be Jewish, um, you know, and comes and, and he works for a, an eccentric uh, American, you know, sort of a, Elon Musk kind of guy. He's got brilliant inventions on the one one hand, and and then he's got some ideas that that might be brilliant, that might be crazy, that he wants to have researched. And and Friedman does this, and then and then World War One breaks out, and then and he keeps he he keeps the the flame alive, uh, the sigient flame alive in in the code breaking, I should say, the code breaking uh, flame alive in in uh, the post war period, and then. And and and, um, you know, and he has these. Uh, Jeff mentioned earlier the the breakdowns, and so uh, he gets worn out by this um, by this work. And after they break the Japanese code in 1940, he collapses. He's just like one day at work, boom, he's down. And they they take him to Walter Reed, uh, which is already like the the army and the government's uh, premier hospital in D.C. And uh, Friedman won't tell him anything about his work. 
And so they think, boy, this is a real nutcase. And they put him in a locked ward for three months and, um, you know, and eventually he goes home. But the poor guy relapses like four or five times after that and, and, and just, um, you know, I think he's a, he, he, he's a tragic, noble figure. Um, and, uh, he, he, and, and nobody's written a biography of him. There's, there's one popular biography like 30 years ago, but um, Jeff and I love footnotes. I hope, I hope you all love footnotes too, because there's a lot of them in this book. Uh, and, but, but, so you need, a, you need a serious biography of Friedman with some, with some uh, you know, source material. And, and uh, you know, if you can pry, uh, if, if the, the secret, if, the, if his story is declassified enough, I think it's a, it's a great um, topic. And the, I, got a shout, I got a shout out for the NSA uh, librarians. Um, so I wrote a lot of this book during the pandemic, and I had done some of the research before. Then the pandemic, you know, we basically stayed home for a year. And um, so I, a lot of research is, is on the net, I'm going here and there and everywhere, and finding like the FDR library has declassified and, and, uh, and, and um, posted 800,000 pages of documents. 800, imagine, and it's probably up to a million by now. So you could do your research, uh, you know, without leaving home, and then you could go back to the document, which is even better than what happens before, because you take notes and, you, and, and, then, and then you wonder if you, you, you'd gotten it right. <laughs> but the NSA guys, um, even though uh, the librarian who I have a little personal relationship with says, well, I'm making an exception for you because, you know, I considered CIA to be an existential threat. Uh, so, uh, talk about talk about collaboration between the services. But this guy took stuff and World War II stuff. I mean, nothing nothing irregular here. But he would post it if he already had it digitized. He would post it and let hi historians like me um, use it during the during the pandemic. And that was just a an enormous help. So um, you know, I've, uh, a shout out to librarians like that gentleman. Um, and the FBI is pretty good too. The FBI has a, a FOIA reading room that that uh, has a, a, they start diving into that collection. Uh, it's 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 pretty rich. They had a, a large file on um, William Donovan, and uh, nobody has quite settled the argument on is there another file that they had uh, on Donovan that was not an official file. Um, there may have been, or there might not have been. But anyway, I, I you know. I love I love librarians uh, for what they do for the profession. So you may have gotten a glimpse of Nick's next next book, perhaps, but I think you did see you know how much work Nick put into researching this book, how much experience he brought to bear, both you know the academic side and from his uh, career in in the military and in intelligence. And so you know, please uh, join me in thanking Nick again for bringing this to, to JSAL. Thank you,